Good morning everybody, this is Stephen Pugh of the Home Bible College. It is February the 7th. Um, in the next chapter, beginning with chapter 4, Moses describes the instructions of the Lord concerning the sin offering and the trespass offering. But in between them he describes the law of the Lord concerning uncleanness. Now, <clears throat> I want to show you something. <clears throat> if I was going to be telling you or showing you a book about woodwork it would be something like this this is a woodwork book and those of you that are interested in woodwork would go through it and you would find that it's woodwork after woodwork after woodwork after woodwork and it just is all about woodwork now of course if you're interested in woodwork that's great I'm interested in woodwork it's something I've been done all my life um, but if you're not interested in woodwork then I understand that for you it would be a very boring book <laughs> Now the, chap the book of Leviticus is a book, it's a handbook for the priests of Israel and it's all about sacrifice, sacrifice, sacrifice and more sacrifice. So if you're not interested in sacrifices then I can understand that it would be a boring book. However, the priests of Israel were very interested in sacrifice. In fact, the whole of the children of Israel were very interested in sacrifice. And we're going to see why that was so today. Now, <clears throat> the Lord of Moses had two aspect, two aspects to it. There was the laws of the Lord, which were the rule of life for the children of Israel. And they were positive and negative. And obedience to the law was expected of Israel those who obeyed the law were called the righteous obedience to the law was never brought salvation to Israel as Christians understand it in fact under the law salvation was not possible at all one cannot be under the Mosaic law and under grace at the same time and we know that salvation Christian salvation is by grace if Israel kept the law they received the blessings of God but if they sinned and forsook the Lord and they came under the curses of the law. For the Christian under grace, things are very different. Christians are saved by grace and possess every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And Christians never come under the condemnation of God because their sins have been completely forgiven. They are in Christ and therefore in Christ they are forever accepted in the beloved in Christ. Now the Apostle Paul before he was converted remained a law-keeping Jew with a clear conscience. What this means is that if he sinned he came to the priest and he offered a sin offering and his sin was covered. There were a number of offerings he could have offered which we see but um, the sin offering was the most common. In Philippians chapter 3 Paul says concerning law Sorry, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Oh, notice it doesn't say sinless, because no man under the law is sinless, but he can be made blameless because um, when he goes and makes an offering, his sin is covered, not taken away, his sin is covered, and therefore nobody can accuse him of sin when he has been made blameless when his sin has been covered and then in verse 7 he says but what things were gained to me those I counted loss for Christ yea doubtless I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but done that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So for Paul to become saved, he had to leave off his law keeping and come as an unworthy sinner back to receive the righteousness of Christ by grace. This was a righteousness that was of God, and it was by faith. Let's get back to the sin offering. This offering was an atonement for sin. It was not a sweet smell to the Lord. It was for the sins of commission and omission. 
In this offering, the sin of the people was confessed before the Lord, and some of the blood is put on the horns of the altar, and the rest of it is poured out at the base of the altar. This sacrifice did not bring about forgiveness of sins as Christian knows it, know, know it, but it does bring about forgiveness as the Old Testament covenant describes it. The sins were covered, they were put out of sight. And then the whole animal was burnt outside the camp. Next Moses turns his attention to the subject of uncleanness. And we see at once that if a man hears the voice of swearing, then he is unclean. If a man touch an unclean thing like the carcass of a dead animal, even if he's unaware of it, then he is unclean. If a man comes into contact with uncleanness in mankind, then he is unclean. If a man finds himself to be unclean, then he is to bring his trespass offering to the Lord. Israel was to be holy to the Lord in the sense that they were to be clean before the Lord. If they became unclean, then a trespass offering was offered to the Lord. The trespass offering was a ram without blemish, and the offerer also brought money. If he owes a certain sum, then he must bring 20% extra to make amends for what harm has been done. Just on a little point there, um, <clears throat> those that were tanners, those that tanned uh, leather, were always considered to be permanently unclean because they were handling the dead bodies of animals. Um, even me in my work as an antique restorer would also theoretically be unclean because I'm handling the dead fish scales and horses hooves from which we make the glue. So that's um, part of a dead animal and so that would theoretically render me to be unclean as well. Now <clears throat> Let's have a look back in the passage. There's a couple of things that caught my attention today, and I'll share with you my password for today. Um, notice it says in verse 2, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do any of them, if the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people then let him bring for his sin which he hath sinned a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for a sin offering now the question we might ask is how can Israel be found guilty of sin when they're not aware that they've sinned how can you confess a sin that you don't know about well that's very interesting you see, the Lord had not only um, given to Israel an opportunity to come into this state of holy relationship with the Lord, but the Lord also gave to Israel his judgments, which would enable them to know that they had sinned. So, for example, if a man sinned and wasn't aware of his sin, then the judgments of God would come upon him. His animals would not give birth. His crops would not grow. His body would slowly die. He would get a disease or something else more like that would happen. It would be very obvious, very patently obvious that he was in a state of sin to himself. And he would go to the priest and say, I think I've sinned a sin and I'm not aware of it. Sometimes, of course, his conscience would strike him and he would then become aware of his sin. But the important thing to notice is this, is that under the old covenant, it was possible to sin and be completely ignorant of it. The Apostle Paul was like this. He said uh, to um, he said in his defense in the Acts of the Apostles, he says, I have lived in all good conscience before God until this day. Now, what he means by that is he doesn't mean that he's he's never sinned or that he's never um, had a bad conscience. What he means is that whenever he has discovered that he sinned and whenever his conscience has smote him, then he has then um, availed himself of the sacrificial system that the Lord had ordained for him to be able to have his conscience cleared. 
that's the point <clears throat> let's, let's go on down through the passage um, my password is well I have a number of interesting passwords today verse 13 let's have a look at that if the whole congregation of Israel sin through ignorance and the thing be hid from the eyes of the assembly they have done some, somewhat against any of the commandments of the Lord concerning things which should not be done and are guilty okay so they're guilty definitely and yet they don't know that they're guilty when the sin that they have sinned is known then the congregation shall offer a young bullock for the sin and bring him before the tabernacle of the congregation so not only did the Lord enter into this relationship with Israel but he also provided for Israel a way whereby they were able to know when they had sinned even if it was completely accidental or it was completely in ignorance you see the point let's move on down a little bit further take a look at the th verse 28 it says or if his sin which he has sinned come to his knowledge then he shall bring his offering okay a kid of the goats and so on now <clears throat> So this explains a great deal, doesn't it? A great deal about how Israel had their very unique relationship with the Lord. Take a look at verse 1 of the next chapter. And if a soul sin and hear the voice of swearing. Now this isn't foul language. This is actually swearing um, an oath before the Lord which um, is not going to be carried out. You see that's the particular point um, if he hears the voice of swearing and is a witness whether he has seen or known of it or if he does, does not utter it then he shall bear his iniquity or if a soul touch an unclean thing whether it is the carcass of an unclean beast or the carcass of unclean cattle or the carcass of unclean creeping things so a person could become unclean before the Lord by touching something that's dead and in particular touching an animal that was unclean that would be like a double uncleanliness or if he touched the uncleanness of man whatsoever uncleanness it be that a man shall be defiled with all and it be hid from him when he knoweth it then he shall be guilty so the sin is a sin even in ignorance However, the guilt is only attributed when it becomes known to the person that has sinned. See, we need to be sort of fairly forensic in the way in which we think about these things. And take a look at verse 11. I love that. Verse 11. It says, If he be not able to bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons, then he that sinned shall bring for his offering the tenth part of of an ephah of fine flour for a sin offering there's a verse in in um, in uh, in Hebrews which says almost all things are by the law purged with blood but of course not everything was purged with blood um, there's no blood in fine flour and so this fine flour was um, an offering um, and it was offered upon the altar without blood and it brought about um, an atonement for sin. It was a sin offering. Wow, how interesting. Now take a look at verse 14. Um, in verse 14 we have the interesting thing of a trespass offering. See, there's different types of offering. And this is the last of the, of the few. The trespass offering was a very specific type of sin. If a soul commit a trespass and sin through ignorance in the holy things of the Lord, then he shall bring for his trespass unto the Lord a ram without blemish. So a trespass then is when a person strays into holy things and he may not know about it. He may have touched something that was holy when he shouldn't have done or he might have touched something that was holy when he was unclean all these things are different types of sin and of course as the Lord specifies the particular points about what sin is for Israel and how they are to deal with the different types of sin and especially how they're to deal with it when they're completely ignorant of it this 
is really what life under the old covenant was like very different to the life of a Christian totally different to the life of a Christian well there we are there's my thought for the day on these matters and I look forward to catching up with you again tomorrow so have a great day and God bless you all bye for now